Romans 8 is where I will be to conclude the sermon. But this sermon is going to be a very difficult sermon to preach. I'm sure it's going to be a difficult sermon to hear because we're in this umbrella of who as I am. When Moses asked God, who do I say sent me? God says, tell them that I am sent you. Meaning that whatever we need, God is. That verb to be. And we've looked at several of the I am statements in the book of John. We've looked at several attributes of God. But this morning, we're going to look at God's providence. What does it mean that God is provident? And it ties directly into the sermon I preached, the first one under this series, Who As I Am, that God is sovereign. The most important thing about you is your view of God. How you see God, everything in your life flows from how you see God, whether you seek after Him or you run from Him. Whether you're a true believer or an avowed atheist, your view of God dictates everything about you. I've said this many times, I know you believe in God, or you wouldn't be here on a Sunday morning to worship Him, but do you know the God in whom you believe? Do you know the great I Am? Do I know the great I Am as revealed to us from His Word? Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, on the screen and in your handout this morning. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. God's desire is for us to know him and to know him more and more. Sometimes we don't like to study the attributes of God because it makes us feel uncomfortable, but I believe the more we know Him for who He is, the more we'll glorify Him, the more we glorify Him, the more we'll enjoy our daily walk with Him. But it's all based on knowing Him, and He wants us to know Him. That's why He revealed Himself to us and what He wants us to know about Him in His Holy Word. Here's a very important question I have you answer each week in this series, so would you responsibly answer it again this morning? What is the chief end of man? I know it's repetitious, but I hope that you hear that every single day when you wake up. My aim today is to glorify God and enjoy my daily walk with Him. It's not about living for ourselves. It's about living to bring the only one glory that deserves glory, and that's our Savior, Jesus Christ. God's providence. The word providence is a combination of two words. It's pro-video. Pro means before. Video means to see. So the word providence literally translates that God sees before. God sees beforehand. The better way to define that is what I put on your handout and on the screen this morning. Providence is God's gracious oversight of the universe. It ties into His sovereignty. God controls all things. But when we say God is provident, that means God's involved in everything. And as soon as I say that, that makes you uncomfortable this morning. Hopefully after the sermon's over, you won't be uncomfortable, but you'll worship the great I Am because He is provident, because He sees beforehand, because He's involved in everything. When we say God is provident, we're saying God not only knows the big picture, God's involved and concerned with the big picture. He knows every detail. When we say God is provident, we're saying nothing escapes God's notice. With God, there's no small things or big things. With God, there's just all things. We're the one who make them small or big. God uses everything and He wastes nothing. And we'll learn that this morning when we struggle with His providence this morning. I want to share with you some of these other attributes we looked at and think about him now under God's providential hand, that he is an oversight of all the universe. Number one, God is sovereign, which means God controls all things. God is omnipresent, which means God sees all things. God is omniscient, which, mean God, which means God knows all things. God is omnipotent, which means God can do all things. God is holy, which means God is above all things. And God is provident, which means God is involved in all things. Listen to how I can 
use God's word this morning to help you see some of the providence of God. We could go to verses that talk about God knows the sparrow when it would fall from the earth. God knows the exact number of hairs on your head. For some of you, that's not much, remember, but for some of you, it's a big feat this morning, Brother Jim. But <laughs> <laughs> Scripture says that God knows every word before we speak it. Scripture says God knows what we're going to pray before we pray it. But Colossians 1.17 says, and he is before all things. To see before, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Proverbs 16.9 the heart of a man plans his own ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. The Lord's involved in each person's steps. Psalms 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. God is in control, and God loves you and loves me, and he's involved in every step of our life. I'm going to ask Kara Huber to come up at this time and share her testimony. Kara, come on up. Talk about the providence of God. We'll see the providence of God in Kara's life. Good morning. I'd like to read one verse of scripture and I'm going to share just a brief part of my testimony. From Psalms 100 verse 3. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Uh, Brother Ricky asked me to talk about God's providence because I had shared this part of my testimony in a finance committee meeting recently. My parents married in 1960 and my dad was a seminary student at the time. And when they married, they knew that they were not going to be able to have children. After graduating seminary, my dad took his first church in Empire, Louisiana, and they visited Sellers Baptist Home, and they adopted a son in 1962. And the process was very easy, it was very simple, it had occurred very quickly, and they were blessed with that son in their home. So their plans were that they would follow the same process in a couple of years and adopt more children. In 1963, my dad was called to a church in um, Anniston, Alabama, and so they moved there, and I guess they were unable to find a, a Baptist home for unwed mothers like Sellers was in New Orleans. So they registered with the state of Alabama to adopt a child. So they did that soon after they moved, and they prayed about the baby uh, that could come into their home. And they ended up praying for years and they wrote officials, and they even wrote the governor, who was Lurleen Wallace at the time, and they still have the letter from her. And they asked, and they pleaded, and they prayed, and it's, you know, it's been years. Why can't we have a child in our home? Why are you not placing home, uh, children in Calhoun County? Meanwhile, there was a young lady in um, northern Illinois who became pregnant. She was a college student. and. Her family did not want it known that she was pregnant, so she was sent from Illinois to Mobile to stay with family members to have this child. And um, they were a Catholic family, but they kept it so secret that they didn't want her to work with Catholic charities. They wanted her to work with the state and place the baby into adoption through the state of Alabama. And so she went through some counseling for several months while she was there and was staying with family. And when she was filling out the pay final paperwork before the birth of the baby, me, she filled out that the only request was she wanted that child to be placed in a Christian home, in a religious home. So my parents, who had started the uh, process of adopting baby in 1963, this young girl in 1968 in the summer writes this to be placed in a religious home. And so that baby was placed with my parents. So after five months of waiting and pleading and praying, I was adopted into that home. And because of that, I was raised in a Christian home. And I was raised in a home with the foundation of Jesus. I was raised in church. I was taught to love Jesus. And I accepted him as my Savior at a very young age. And if it hadn't been for God's plan through that whole process and God's providence, it's just a blessing that that's where I was placed and that's where I grew up and that's where I got my foundation. And so God 
has a plan for us. We are His people. We are His sheep. And through any trials, anything you're facing, we may not get that answer immediately, but we, it will be answered at some point in time. So I just wanted to share that with you all this morning. Thank you. God's gracious oversight of the universe. God is in control of all things. He's involved in all things. What will happen this morning as we struggle, as we wrestle with God's providence, as he's involved in all the areas of our life? Four things on your handout and on the screen I want us to look at this morning as we wrestle with God's providence. Number one, God's providence should and it will free us from bitterness. Life can make you bitter. Circumstances of life can create resentment in you, create animosity in you. When I preached on the sovereignty of God, I used this example of Joseph and the story of Joseph out of Genesis, especially Genesis chapter 50, where all these things happened to Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was taken into Potiphar's home and then Potiphar's wife made advances to him and he stayed faithful to God and she makes up this account which gets him thrown into prison. While he's there, the baker and the cupbearer come in to prison as well. He interprets their dreams and you know most of this story that Joseph could have been bitter, but he trusted in the providence of God. And in Genesis 50, I read this verse when we looked at the sovereignty of God, verses 19 and 20. When he's in front of his brothers and now his father has passed away and his brothers are in fear that now Joseph will have their lives taken as well. Joseph said to them, do not fear, for I am the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. When you understand that God's involved, sovereign, providential God is involved in every area of your life, it will cause us not to get bitter. We ask sometimes the wrong question when things happen. We ask this question a lot, why do bad things happen to good people? And let's be honest, bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to Joseph, even though Joseph was seeking after God. But I want to suggest this morning that maybe we should not be asking the why question. Maybe we should be asking the how or the what question. Since God is providential, since God's involved in every area of our life, not why is this thing happening, but what is God doing in this circumstance? How does God want me to respond in this circumstance? When this bad thing happens that would cause me to be bitter, God, what are you trying to teach me? How are you trying to grow me? Because you love me. You're involved in every area of my life. And you want me to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, the scripture says. You want to grow me to be all you would have me to be. So instead of getting bitter, Lord, help me to learn what you would have me to learn. Because I trust you. Even though I can't see your invisible hand, I trust you because you're involved in every area of my life. Second thing that we should learn from the providence of God is not to be bitter, but also not to let tragedies cause us to have the wrong perspective. We need a new perspective when tragedies happen. Just looking around the sanctuary this morning and seeing some of your faces and knowing some of you personally and the tragedies you've been through. From losing loved ones to accidents, some as small children. When tragedies come, we often question the providential hand of God. I saw two tragedies in the scripture as I was studying this past week and thought about them and how these two tragedies cause people to trust God no matter what. The first one deals with David after learning that his infant is dead. 2 Samuel 12 is on the screen in your handout this morning. 2 Samuel 12, verse 22. David, he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept. For I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. David didn't understand why his son was dead. He knew there was a consequence for his sin, but he didn't understand it, but he trusted in God's providence. 
He trusted that even through the tragedy, God wanted to grow David to be more like himself. Then I went obviously to the book of Job. When you think about Job having lost everything, in Job 1, verses 20 through 22, then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and he fell on the ground and he worshiped. <laughs> A tragedy happens and Job worships. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Two tragedies, both people responded in faith, not understanding, but trusting the providential hand of God. Do you know how much God loves you? Do you know how much he cares for you? That he's involved in every area of your life. You know, the other day, our children say some amazing things. God teaches me so much through my two amazing boys. Noah came to me the other day and just very bluntly, Noah said, Daddy, you love Joshua a lot more than you love me. I was taken back. I was like, son, what are you talking about? He said, you gave me one biblical name, but you gave Joshua two. His name's Joshua Daniel Cummings. And I didn't know what to say because he was right. We gave him two biblical names and Noah only one. Noah's middle name is Tate, T-A-I-T, -T, which when it's spelled that way means blessed by God. And we had picked that out obviously for that reason. And then my mother and father were watching them the very next day. And when my mom and dad picked up Noah and Joshua, the first thing that Noah says is, you don't love daddy very much, do you? <laughs> to which my dad said, what are you talking about? He said, you didn't give either one of your children, any of the three, any biblical names. <laughs> I started thinking about that. You know, if you've ever been in any area of life, whether it's sports, whether it's in a classroom, you know, sometimes people play favorites whether it's a coach or whether it's a teacher. But I thought about, you know, with God, we're all his favorites. With God, we're no different than Noah, Ruth, Peter, Paul, you know, the great men and women of the faith that you think about today, Billy Graham. God loves us all the same. And he wants to be involved in every area of our life. And we understand that he's involved in every area when he's providential, that he doesn't play favorites, that he loves us all, it will free us from bitterness. It will give us a new perspective on tragedies. And number three this morning, God's providence will give me courage to keep going even in difficult times. When I can't see his invisible hand, I have to trust him. I have to keep going during very difficult times. Why? Because two things are evident in the scripture that everything that happens to us synergistically as a whole happens for our good and for God's glory. Everything leads to our good and to God's glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an internal weight of glory beyond all comparison. The worst tragedy that someone could go through is a momentary affliction compared to the glory of being in God's presence forever. Verse 18, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen, the ESV says, are transient, which means temporary, momentary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. James 1 verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, mature, scripture says, lacking in nothing. When we go through difficult times, God wants to take that and work it for our good as a whole, synergistically, and for God's glory, even through very difficult times. God's providential hand. Think about it this way. I found this in a commentary about God's providential hand. Life is hard, but God is good. 
God uses everything. He wastes nothing. He is in charge of what happens, when it happens, how it happens, why it happens, and even what happens after it happens. This is true of all events in every place from the beginning of time. He does this for our good and his glory. He's not the author of sin, yet evil serves his purposes. He does not violate our free will, yet free will serves his purposes. We're not supposed to understand all this. We're simply supposed to believe it. And in believing, we make the choice that God is good and that he can be trusted in every situation. God's in control. He's sovereign. He loves us. He's involved in every area, every detail of our life. And the fourth concept that I want us to grab hold of this morning, God's providence will free me from bitterness. It'll give me a new perspective on tragedies. It will give me courage to keep going even in difficult times. But don't miss this last point this morning. God's providence will, I started to say force me. <laughs> I think it will force us. It'll cause us to choose to live by faith. Knowing he's involved knowing he's got a perfect plan that we might not understand this side of heaven. We might not understand it in heaven because we're not God. Only God is God. We are fallen human beings and it's hard for us to conceive the mind of God and the hand of God that will work even through tragedies to bring about our good and his glory. Do you think the cross that Jesus died on and what he went through was a tragedy? I would say it was uh, the greatest tragedy of all, but God used it for our good and for his glory. He even took the betrayal of Judas and used it for our good and his glory. He used Pilate washing his hands of the whole thing for our good, the ultimate death of Jesus Christ for our sins to bring honor and glory to God. Do we walk by faith? Do we choose to trust that God's in control and involved in every area of our life, even if we can't understand it, even if we can't figure it out, even if there's so much evil in this world and tragedies happen all the time and bad things do happen to good people, God is still involved and God is still in control. And God is still worthy of our praise, whether we understand it or not, he is still God and nothing changes the fact that he has died for us to set us free from the bondage of sin. Romans 8, we're finally to the verse of scripture, Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. And we know. It's not a hope so, it's not a wish, it's not a dream. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And we know God is in control. God is involved. He is providential. He sees everything before it happens and he cares and he's involved and we should know that he will work those things as a whole for our good and for God's glory. Not some things, all things, Romans 8, 28 says. That means tragic things, bad things, ugly things. God still takes those and uses them to help us be more conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight seeing things and trying to comprehend what they mean. We don't walk by seeing things, whether we understand or not. We walk by faith. By faith, we trust that God is who he says he is. By faith, we believe that his death on the cross paid for our sins, that when he rose from the grave, he gave us victory over death, and that because he rose victoriously from the grave, that we will rise one day and spend eternity with him, and that our sins have been paid for, and we've been forgiven. We trust in that, not by what we can see in this evil world. We trust in that by faith. Do you wake up every morning, whether you consider it a good day or a bad day, do you trust God's providential hand that he's in control and that this is temporary? What we're going through right now is just a blink 
in the moment of all eternity and we're not living for the here and now, we're living for the one day with Jesus Christ our Savior. He's in control, trust Him. He's involved in every area of your life. Trust Him, even when you don't understand. I started thinking about how to conclude the message this morning because it's a hard concept for us to wrestle with. To know that God's involved and how tragedy and all this works into God's ultimate plan. Again, maybe the question isn't a why question. Maybe the question is, what are you teaching me, God? How can I learn what you want me to learn? And how can I grow to be all you would have me to be? And how is this helping me in becoming more good in your eyes and ultimately to give you honor and glory? Maybe this morning the providential hand of God is leading somebody to faith in him as Lord and Savior. Maybe the way that God's involved is that God providentially had you here this morning to hear that he loves you and is involved in every area of your life and the Holy Spirit's prompting you at this moment to turn from your sin and place your trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe the providential hand of God this morning has you here, you know that you're saved, but maybe his providential hand has you here and he's speaking to your heart saying, repent of your sin and walk closer with me, stay in fellowship with me. Maybe God's providential hand is having you just walk deeper steps of faith with him because you're going through a very difficult time and God's saying, just trust me. Think about Joan this morning coming up to me for the service and telling me that her brother is not doing very good and that we need to be praying for her brother who's on life support and how can God work even a tragedy like someone's beloved brother being on life support? for our good and God's glory because God's still God. And the death on this earth is not the end. It's just the beginning for those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. See, we look at death differently than a lost person looks at death. Death for us is ultimately for our good and for God's glory. All it is is a passageway from this life that's temporary to the one that matters for all eternity. And for a believer, that's not a bad thing at all. You know, sometimes we pray for healing. I think sometimes the ultimate healing that God wants to give is to take somebody from this life and bring them into his presence forever. He did that with Elijah in his providential hand. He did that with men and women that have died and left this earth but are now in his presence because he works all things for our good and for his glory. The question is, do you really believe that? The question is, are you willing to walk by faith and not by sight? Look at the heroes of the faith and all the tragedies and difficulties they went through, but they kept trusting in God, whether they could understand it or not. The more Paul sought after God, the more tragedies as the world looks at tragedies happened to Paul. The more time he would spend in prison. He wanted to go to Rome. His heart's desire was to go there, but most people believe he never went there. But he's in prison and he's just churning out a third of the New Testament by the power of the Holy Spirit because he knew that God probably gave him some downtime so he'd have more time to write. The providential hand of God. God's involved in every area of our life. Just like he's involved in Kara's life, God knew exactly what he was doing to move parents there, to adopt her, to raise her in a Christian home. She only told you about half of the story. There's so much hand of the providential love of God in Kara's life, but it's not just in Kara's life. It's in every single one of our lives. I think about the many, many years I drove through Slidell, Louisiana, headed to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and never once, and this not to offend you, okay, but never once in my mind did I say, Slidell, Louisiana, that's where I'm going to live. <laughs> I'm going to pastor First Baptist Church, Slidell, Louisiana. No, to be honest with you, I just couldn't wait to class to get over and head back home, and I was just flying through Slidell. I, I barely got off at an exit in Slidell unless it was to pick up something at a fast food place and eat while I was driving. It never crossed my mind that I would be the pastor of First Baptist Church Slidell and that I would live in Slidell, Louisiana. And we were coming down for our initial visit, and Christy and I were talking, and we're looking at each other, and we're like, Slidell, Louisiana, just nothing that ever crossed our radar she said, do you think this is where God wants us? And I said, I'm still praying about it, but I'm feeling strongly led in this direction and it just can't explain it. 
And now after being here a little over a year, I see God's providential hand and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else but Slidell, Louisiana. Why? It's the providential hand of God. Don't forget this morning, God loves you the same way he loves Moses, the same way he loves Beth Moore, the same way he loves David Platt. He loves you just the same way that he loves other people that we see as giants in the faith. He doesn't play favorites. He loves us all, and his providential hand is involved in every area of your life. And when you can't understand why you're going through what you're going through, just trust God. He's still God. The enemy wants to take the situations we go through and cause us to run away from God. God's saying, draw near to me. Learn what I'm trying to teach you. Grow in your faith. I'm coming to mature you. I'm not coming to make you happy. I'm coming to make you holy. And to make you holy, sometimes I have to be abrasive as iron sharpens iron so one person sharpens another. Sometimes you have to go through very difficult situations to learn what God is teaching you because he loves you and he wants to grow you to be more conformed to the image of his son. Let's pray this morning.